when uh, the finance minister says this is a temporal pain for a better tomorrow, it's costing the nation something. For instance, we know that SMEs, small and medium scale enterprises, represent 80% of Nigeria's registered companies. They employ approximately 60% of uh, workers in the private sector. And it seems these days that uh, most of those people are either at the ATM, the banks, or at uh, the filling stations. And we've seen some drama, even, uh, I know some of us have seen those videos making the rounds that cannot be broadcast. Uh, you know, uh, of some people who have gotten really frustrated and upset at banks and asking to be given their money. So apart from those, uh, these things are also feeding into economic activities, economic data, the non-oil, the expectations and forecasts we have from the non-oil sector uh, at the end of the day, of course, all of this will be affected. So let's see if we can put some numbers to, to this, these disruptions, and see what is costing the economy. Uh, we have for this conversation, Inyo Bong Usen is the head of research with budget, uh, joining us from Abuja. I believe we're also supposed to have Professor Ishala Lawal, he's the head of economics department. Uh, professor of Economics with Bowen University will also be joining us for this conversation. Let's start with you, Inyobong. Uh, good morning. Uh, how much disruption has this brought? Uh, talking of your personal experience now, because I believe if you're living in Nigeria, you must have felt either the, the money, the naira, or the feel. Yeah, good morning, Inyan. Thanks for having me. I mean, uh, this policy has, in the short, short term, for the impoverished people. As of today, uh, for every Naira you have saved in the bank, when you want to withdraw from the POS, you lose about 15% of that money. So if I'm going to withdraw 10,000 Naira now from the bank or from the from a POS machine, they charge about 1,500 Naira. That's 15% lost. And so that reduces my own disposable income. Now in access to the Naira, you go to an ATM now, if it's an ATM that you use, your bank, you're only able to withdraw 2,000 Naira. If it's, if, it, if it's an ATM of a bank you don't use, you're only able to withdraw 1,000 Naira. Now, if you juxtapose that with the fact that only about 45% of Nigerians are banked, meaning that um, the larger uh, bulk of the population is unbanked and do not have access to financial services. In my local government, for instance, there is no bank. And the only access people have to financial services are through the POS operators and maybe the agency uh, bankers, as the case may be. But as we've seen over the last couple of days, it's been very difficult even for the POS operators or, or the agency bankers to access the Naira, whether the old or the new. Now, what happens to the economic activities in that particular local government? everything would be brought to a hold. People who have their produce, perishable for that matter, cannot sell. And you lose all of that. Who pays for that? And so it's, it's made the life of the average Nigerian unbearable. If you come to, to energy, um, petrol, for instance, in some parts of the country, some persons are buying petrol for as high as 700 Naira. Like you rightly said, 60% or 49% of Nigeria's GDP is contributed to by the MSMEs. And so you have a large part of the population. I mean, we have about 41.5 million MSMEs in Nigeria. If I'm a roadside barber and the average cost of cutting, you know, I charge for cutting hair is 300 Naira. And I get an average of maybe just two to three hours supply of electricity daily. How much money am I going to make, right? By charging 300 Naira when I buy fuel at 700 Naira that's if, if I can even see it to buy. So in the short term, it's not been really uh, palatable for Nigerians. People have not been able to commute from one place to the other. I mean, in my office, we had to reduce the number of uh, physical working days to two days in a week because it was practically impossible to commute for people to commute to work. So it's not been a pleasurable experience uh, for me. And I believe I speak for uh, a million of, um, of, of Nigerians. Mm. 
So we do expect, of course, that this will feed into inflation numbers. But let, let me talk to Professor uh, Lawao first and, and get his own experience. Oh. Prof, uh, good morning. Uh, share with us how you are in Iwo in Oshu State. How has it been in, in let's say, in the last yes. one week when, when we talk about access to Naira uh, cash, access to me. petrol and all? Also, let me start by you. Hello? I can hear you, Prof. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Let me start the conversation by first uh, sympathizing with Nigerians. Um, we are be devil with two tsunamis at the same time. Uh, the first one being the uh, resumptions of queue Q, uh, Q at the filling stations. And then uh, now um, Q, large standard of queues at our ATM points. Uh, see if there's a competition between the bank, the banking industry, and uh, the filling station, I mean, the, for the oil industry, on, on who have the largest, who can get the largest queue. So I sympathize with Nigeria on that one. But that being said, I must confess that, uh, um, you see, nothing of value comes so easy. If we go back to during, during board, I think uh, in 2012, there about, the Central Bank of Nigeria launched a uh, cashless policy uh, uh, system in which that they want to move Nigerian transactions uh, environment from cash to cashless or electronics. And then um, uh, from time to time, Central Bank has been introducing the you know, mayor moving us towards this. Uh, it will interest you that uh, as of today, before the introduction of this currency re re redesigning, about 90% of transactions in Nigeria are cash-based. And uh, though it has its own advantages, but if you look at the consequences, I think uh, to a large extent, you would say it is better that we move towards uh, a cashless system. And uh, I think uh, what we are experiencing now, mm -hmm. everywhere you go, ATM points, um, um, banking points, you see Q, uh, you know that uh, Nigeria now is a very trying moment for every Nigeria and as a battle with every one of us. So uh, I, I, I hear you that we need to go cashless. Are there, is yeah. this the best way? Could, could we have avoided the pain that Nigerians are feeling at this time? Well, uh, I think uh, let's first of all understand the dynamics of our system. Uh, first, uh, volume of money circulation is about four trillion, between 3.3 to 4.0 to 4 trillion now. And then uh, if you look at the percentage of money circulation to GDP in Nigeria, we will know that uh, I think I've, uh, in my memory, I'm aware we're about 30 million Nigeria who have no bank accounts. And uh, but. Uh, All right, looks like we've lost Prof there. So we'll just go to Nyobong. Nyobong, do, do you think we could, have, we could have had it easier? Could we have had this movement to the cashless economy easier or another way than, you know, the way it on we are three now? Main, uh, what's it called? Hello? He built it on three main uh, points. One, that he want to, first of all, uh, for economy, to insecurity, and then to strengthen our democracy. Uh, insecurity, you agree with me that Nigeria is being with uh... All right, uh, since and, uh, uh, you know, the uh, network clear. that we have with Professor Lawal seems unstable. He's speaking to us from Iwo, uh, in Oshun State, so um, I guess coming to surprise but let's let's head to in your bond now any do you think that we could have had this you know another way could we could this transition we had the minister there say it's transient so nigerians should endure for you know better results but could we have done this another way with less pain definitely i mean if you look at countries where you know they have changed the the currency over time. These are these are not policy decisions that you know have a, a very you know short or tight knit uh, timeline. They give a, you know a lot of time for persons to be able to transition into using the new currencies. 
one of the points that the professor was trying to raise as one of the reasons why uh, the CBN, you know, went forward with this policy. He had mentioned insecurity and he was trying to, you know, sort of cite um, or sort of replay the, the security situation of the country at the moment. I do not think it's the business of the central bank to fight insecurity. It's, it's in the realm of, of fiscal policy. And uh, this has been one of the, you know, challenges we've had with the central bank, you know, for into the, the fiscal policy space. If you even want to look at uh, this policy on the reduction in, in money in circulation or currency in circulation, it doesn't necessarily reduce the entire money supply. Total money supply as at December 2022 was at about 52 trillion. And if you look at um, also currency in circulation as at that time, too, it was about 2.6 trillion, not just about 5% of currency in, in circulation, meaning that you still have about 95% of, you know, other instruments of money uh, within the banking system. So reducing money in circulation doesn't necessarily um, translate, to, translate into reducing money supply, which, you know, would achieve that objective of, you know, reducing um, inflation. Although it comes with its attendant sort of effects, Contractionary or hawkish monetary policy, you know, that is uh, geared towards reducing monetary supply, although it has a tendency to dampen inflationary pressures, but it also has the tendency to also um, increase interest rates, which also increases the cost of borrowing. If you look at uh, the PWC survey for SMS, MSMEs in 2020, and you look at what contributed to the cost of operations for MSMEs, you would see that 21%, you know, of that cost was, uh, was due to, was, was um, for electricity. So MSMEs spend 21% of their operation cost on electricity. The third highest, uh, the cost of capital, which is cost of borrowing, which I alluded to earlier, is about 15%. So you are seeing that um, this policy, you know, on two, uh, or two ends or in two ways, is hitting the SMS, MSMEs really badly. On energy, like we, like we see across the country, most businesses, you know, run off the alternative sources of energy that's using their generators and all of that. And so if the cost of petrol has increased from 190 Naira to in some places 700 Naira in less than a month, that sort of, you know, shows you the impact of this policy on the bottom lines of these MSMEs and even poverty. I can tell you for a fact that as a, as a, um, as a result of this uh, policy, a lot of Nigerians last one month or more Nigerians have been you know, pushed further into poverty. Disposable incomes have reduced, which have you know, affected the ability to access um, quality healthcare, access quality education um, and all of that. So, I mean, in the, in the short term, this has not been really um, palatable for, for Nigerians and Nigerian businesses. And I believe that this is one policy that should have been given enough time for implementation. Yeah, but if, as the Minister of Finance said, this is transient, should we be worried? Shouldn't we look at, you know, with the examples she gave, if you want to treat a wound, for instance, you have to endure the present pain for, for it to heal faster. Shouldn't we just endure this and, and have the future in sight? But you asked for how long? They have not given a definite timeline for when this um, problem would abate. There was a timeline for when the policy would take effect, but not a timeline for when the effects would abate. And so uh, do we just wait in perpetuity and continue to suffer? I'm very sure that as a result of you know, this hardship, some persons would die along the way. And so what was the respite for those persons? So we need timelines to be able to, you know, agree with this policy. If there are no timelines and there are, there are things that we expect to just happen in perpetuity or, or we, we take the force of nature, I think that's not sufficient enough reasons for Nigerians to accept this policy. And then uh, I'm just thinking of how this will feed into, you talked about disposable income, of course, inflation. 
you know, so in a couple of weeks, we'll be expecting to get inflation numbers for the month of January. I'm just thinking of how this will feed into that, how that may, may be captured. And of course, that will also determine the policy or the, the direction of the MPC when they meet again. You thought about, you know, the rates, either it's hawkish or dovish, at the end of the day. I mean, all of these are, are connected. Well, definitely. I mean, a, a large, you know, chunk of contributions to inflation is, is energy as well. For when business owners are not able to access um, energy at, you know, very manageable costs, the cost is pushed to the consumer and you expect the, the cost of uh, goods and services to, to increase. If you look at um, the transportation sector, for instance, um, in commercial cities, you see that the prices of, uh, of uh, what it costs um, citizens to commute from one place to the other have risen astronomically. Uh, and so uh, we see that um, if, if this is not abated really quickly, um, it's going to you know, further plunge more people into poverty. And if you even look at um, some of the reasons why the central bank, central bank gives for inflation, you know, they cite you know, money in circulation, excess money in circulation as one of the contributors to inflation. I, I beg to differ slightly. If you look at what the drivers have, of inflation have, have been over the last couple of months, you would look at the borrowing through ways and means, which has risen from about a trillion naira to 23.7 trillion naira in the last seven years. The second is the FX regime, the foreign exchange regime. The huge difference between the parallel market, you know, and the, and the official rate, you know, has sort of created this room for arbitrage. And that has, I mean, the World Bank had stated that it's responsible for 80% of inflation. So if you are not addressing these two things and you are leaving that and trying to use um, the reduction in or contracting or the economy to, to address inflation, um, it, it doesn't you know, necessarily address the problem as the case may be. Hmm. So what for you would be, um, would bring soccer at this time? The, the timeline for the implementation of this policy, you know, needs to be um, sort of, you know, we, we need to give more timeline for the implementation of this policy. Uh, in the interim, in fact, it's becoming a national security issue. If you look at, you know, videos that have been taken from ATMs, from banks, um, it's, it's beginning to lead to a breakdown in law and order. And the more... Um, it becomes difficult for Nigerians to access money that they used to buy, um, food that they used to access, basic amenities. You know, the more the more you would see uh, civil unrest across the federation. So, are, are we willing to take that risk, especially as we have you know really close to the elections? Yeah, uh, that's something that I think the government should, you know, really consider if they are going to go on with this policy. But I think we need more time to be able to implement this policy. It's, okay. not, it's not working in the short term. Okay, so, but I mean, a lot of people will say, even if they, even if they extended the deadline now, <laughs> knowing typical Nigerians, when it gets close to that deadline, there's still going to be a lot of scrambling. Why don't we just deal with it uh, once and for all and, and, you know, move on to the next level? I mean, I would agree with you partly that Nigerians, you know, are always late to respond to these sort of policies. But that doesn't take away the fact that the timeline is short and, you know, the avenues you would have used to reach the citizens. And mind you, we're not even considering citizens in the remote areas. Like I said, where I come from, there is no bank, no deposit money bank. Um, the access to financial services that people have are through the POS agents and some other um, agency bankers. Now, if those POS agents are not able to access this Naira, how do people in those remote, how do you expect people in those remote communities to be able to attend to their basic needs? So these are questions that the government would need to answer really quickly if they decide that they want to stick to this policy. You can imagine if it's this difficult in the city centers, then you can imagine what, the, you, what people in the remote communities are going through at the moment. Okay, how do you think all of this will affect the election? Will it encourage more Nigerians or motivate them to go out there and participate? How will it affect their choice 
uh, hoping that they will not do the anger voting again. <laughs> you know, how do, how do I, you see it playing out at the polls? I expect that it should push a lot of people out to vote. I mean, when people are tired, you, you saw it with the 2015 election, that a lot of the vote, voter turnout was due to, you know, people being fed up with the status quo. And the same thing is happening now. You see people, you know, making proclamations that, you know, they, they've never voted before, but due to the sufferings, they are going to come out to make their voices heard. So I, I think it's going to um, push people to make radical decisions at the polls. And I, I do not see it favoring the party in power at the moment. Mm. Well, I hope it's not uh, anger voting again, because <laughs> we saw that in 2015. Thank you so much, Nio Bongusen, Head of Research with Budget. And do stay safe. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for having me.